All right, here we go. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, this here we are on YouTube. We're going live on YouTube today at four o'clock. And we're going to do seven facts about fascia. And fascia, of course, is a fascinating subject because it's the connective tissue of the body. And the reason why I'm doing this is to contribute to yoga practitioners and yoga teachers who would like to help their students more. So fascia does two things. It either solidifies or it becomes too long and too stretched out. And how that works, I have some interesting things to show. So to begin with, the first fact about fascia is the 3D web of the body, and it connects all the different parts of the body to itself. This is an interesting image I'm going to show you. This is a tensegrity structure. And the tensegrity structure is something that is not attached to the ground, but all the parts are attached to each other. So it's easy to grab a corner of a tensegrity structure and pull it, and the whole rest of the structure follows. And that's really biotensegrity is what the human body is now being considered. And another example of that is this little piece of um, this is the onion bag, right, that came from the grocery store. And you can see if I grab the corners of the onion bag, I can spread it sideways and it gets fatter and wider and spreads out. Or I could grab it and pull it vertically and it becomes taut, right? So that's the same way. This is how the fascia works. It's like a web in the body that surrounds everything. And sometimes we can horizontally spread, spread more horizontally. And then we can also vertically extend the fascia. And this is one of the ways that tractioning the spine is really helpful in yoga. So when you traction the spine, it becomes helpful because when you pull the length of the spine this way, you can see how the fascia becomes narrow and pulls toward the center. So that's a way to help the spine stay in integrity with itself. All those small tissues connecting can stay in integrity with itself. Whereas if we sit at the desk, desk all day long and we spread by collapsing the spine and we just kind of spread wide, then that's what we get. We get a loosey-goosey spot, a weak spot in the spine that doesn't have that tension that can hold it together. So that's a little bit of a stretch. Not just kidding, just a little stretch of your fascia. All right, but that's, so that's the biotensegrity. So one of the things I want you to do, and I'm going to move my chair back a little bit. One of the things I want you to do is wherever you are is just think about stretching one arm overhead. And I know my head's a little cut off on this YouTube thing, but try and settle down. So one arm stretching overhead and notice when you reach that arm that it affects the opposite hip, right? So you can extend an arm. It's not just an arm that extends. It's when you reach with the arm and really reach the stretch goes all the way to the opposite hip, to the opposite knee, to the opposite foot. And you want to observe these connections. So if you're practicing yoga and you do a, ser a series of poses to open your hips or stretch your hamstrings, notice how it affects your shoulders because it will definitely affect the shoulders. It's not going to just affect your hips. It's going to also affect the rest of your body. So that's how it is that fascia as a tensegrity system connects everything in the body to everything else. So that's fact number two. It connects everything to everything else, and it distributes the strain of any movement throughout the whole entire fascial system. No separation throughout the whole system. And then fact number three that I want to share with you is that fascia will break. I sort of implied it already, but fascia will tend to break at its weakest point. So the example of sitting in a chair and always collapsing your spine in the same spot and I have a spot right there that likes to get weak over and over and over again. 
that's the spot that's going to ache. That's the spot that's going to hurt. So those of you who have yoga injuries that have lasted a long time and they keep recurring over and over again, it's probably nothing to do with the muscle structure. It's probably more to do with the fascia, the way the fascia has somehow either been injured or overstretched. So overstretching can become an injury, a fascial injury, especially for yoga practitioners. So an example of that is downward facing dog pose, putting the heels on the ground too soon, overstretching across the top of the pelvis in the lumbar and weakening the fascia in that area. And it's, it's common to see some fascial injuries in yoga. All right, so the next thing I wanna share with you is um, the interesting part about fascial injuries is that they don't show up on an X-ray, an MRI, or a CAT scan. They're not going to show. So you could have a pain somewhere in your body that's recurring. You could go through all the trouble. And I've had students of mine, clients in the past who have done so. And there's no explanation for why they have the pain that they have. So sometimes it's a matter of um, finding what movements need to be added or subtracted from their yoga practice or their exercise routine so that they can strengthen the appropriate fascia in the appropriate areas and heal those injuries. All right, so let's talk about being a yoga teacher for just a moment or being a person who is fairly stiff. So here's a client I had and he's an, uh, he's my age, he's in his 70s. And he's kind of stiff in lots of places. And he was doing some work lifting his arms over his head. I don't know if I can sit down in the chair. Maybe you can see me better. Lifting his arms over his head. And he couldn't get them very far. But he was doing this work. And then he injured his shoulders because he did all this work trying to lift stuff over his head. And he had the x-rays. And he went to PT. And he went to the chiropractor and nobody could figure out what was going on. So what I want you to remember is that because fascia connects everything to everything else, if the fascia in my rib cage, and you could do that on your own body, just grab your side ribs and pull them down and hold them with one hand and then try and raise that arm over your head and see what happens. See how stuck it gets right? So oftentimes when you see your students and they go to take their arms up over their head, they only get this far. They don't get any further than that. It's not necessarily the shoulder, although it could be the shoulder. It could be also be coming from their rib cage. So the fascia around the rib cage is really sh constricted and tight, not movable, not soft. And so the arms don't go up, right? So when there's a free flow and the fascia is flowing freely and it's not stuck anywhere, then the range of motion comes and it's easy to make those movements. All right, I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right, so we said fascia is both fluid and solid. So I'm going to start, let's start with, let's start with something to do for your fascia if it's restricted. And um, this is something I learned from Thomas Myers. He's the gentleman who does the anatomy trains work, a lot of programs he does with Yoga U online, and to give him credit for this particular movement pattern. So the pattern would be to sit sideways in a chair, drop one knee down as if you were doing a lunge, a supported lunge. And just stretch that leg back a little bit so you get a little stretch on your quad. Hold your belly back so you're stable in your belly. Don't let the belly fall out. I call that the clock face. Kind of keep it contained. And we're going to pulse with the arm. So the exhale, and the exhale, I'm going to touch my opposite shoulder. So I'm holding onto the chair. I'm going to exhale, touch my left shoulder with my right hand. And I'm going to inhale and reach down toward my back foot and exhale, touch the shoulder. And then pretend I'm climbing a ladder. Inhale, another six or eight inches up and exhale. Inhale, reach out another six inches and exhale. And inhale, reach out another six inches and exhale. 
and inhale up another six inches. Let the head follow. Exhale, inhale. Exhale. Inhale, reaching up. Exhale down. And then work your way back down the ladder again from the top. Inhaling into the movement. Exhaling, touch the shoulder. Inhale into the movement. Exhale, touch the shoulder. Inhale into the movement. Exhale, touch the shoulder. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. And exhale. And then pause and turn to center front. Take a breath. Notice if you feel more fluid in that whole right side. Mm -hmm. And it was my right arm that I was using. So that's my right side feels more fluid. And I, this is excellent for students who have a lot of um, stiffness in the spine and the rib cage, especially I had one student who had a lot of scoliosis and she was very stiff, had a lot of trouble straightening her arms and downward facing dog pose. And after doing these exercises, she felt a world of difference, much easier for her, much more movement. Okay, so let's go to side two. Reach back a little bit with the bottom leg, pull the belly in. Mm -hmm. And again, exhale, touch left hand to right shoulder. Inhale down toward the foot and exhale back. Inhale a couple inches above that, working your way up the ladder. Inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Keep working your way up. All the way up to the top of your ladder. And then start working your way back down again. So exhale into the shoulder. Inhale, reach out. And I am bending my elbow and then reaching back. So I am not swinging a straight arm. I'm bending my elbow back. Just thought I should point that out. And all the way down. And back. And back. And back. And then again, turn to center front. And then take a stand again. Stand up straight. And come to Tadasana and root your heels into the earth. And then just inhale and swing your arms up and observe the new freedom. Observe the result. Observe the effect of what we just did to loosen the fascia of the ribs and the shoulders. It's a big difference. So if you're honest about it, it's a really big difference. And you can see how that, how that works. All right. So that's that movement. And then I want to go ahead and... Um, this is a favorite one of mine, and it's become a favorite one of my students as well. And this is a fascia stretch for the psoas. So we know that the psoas, the fascia of the psoas connects to the diaphragm. The vagus nerve is wrapped all around the psoas muscle, all imbued in that fascia in the, in the gut. And, and the psoas muscle is what gives us our posture. So when it's contracted, we either have a sway back or we have a collapsed chest. So those are the two things that happen when the psoas is contracted. The top is contracted. The chest collapses this way. The bottom is contracted at the base. Then we have a super, super huge arch in the back, maybe more than we want. All right, so this is a lovely exercise. And what I want you to feel is I want you to feel how tall you are, you are in this moment. Just observe when you're standing how tall you happen to be in this moment. If you feel your shoulders are right over your hips, do the hips come back over the feet? And how tall do you feel? Right, And then we're going to compare. We're going to come back to Tadasana after doing the exercise, and we'll compare again. So sitting in the chair, 
We're going to drop the knee down and stretch it back just a little bit. Flatten your clock face, pull your belly in. Inhale, raise your arms overhead. And then exhale, turn from the lower belly. Grab onto either side of your chair, one hand on each side, and begin to twist from the lower belly and then the bottom ribs and then the middle ribs without turning the head. Let the head be neutral. Do as best a twist as you can and feel the pull, the diagonal pull through the belly from the right knee all the way to the left ribs. Pause for a moment, take a breath and exhale and release and turn back to center. And then let's go to side two, drop the knee down, slide the knee slightly back, flatten your clock face. Mm -hmm. Inhale, raise the arms overhead, get a nice lift of your spine. Exhale, turn from the bottom belly, grab onto the chair and keep, ro and then begin to rotate. So pause on the inhale, exhale, pull the belly in, turn from the lower belly, turn the ribs toward the chair. And be in that twist, again, neutral in the neck. And observe the pull from the knee to the hip, through the belly, to the opposite ribs. And then inhale and exhale, release. Come back to center and come to a standing position. And now again, observe and feel and see if you have the sensitivity to observe that something has changed in your psoas area. Something has changed through the front line of the body. Mm -hmm. And if we had the time, I'd have you go for a walk and feel it and come back and just repeat the exercise and get that opening of the front body. All right, very good. Let's go to downward facing dog pose. What facts have we not done yet? Ah, here's the fact that we need to do. So fact number five, six to 10, there are six to 10 times more sensory neurons in your fascia than in muscle tissue. There's even some research that shows that the motor neurons are located in the fascia, not in the muscle cells but in the fascial tissue that surrounds the muscles. So our sensory neurons, our motor neurons, and that is how the system connects is through the fascia, through the neurons that are in the fascia. But what it also lets us know is that because they're sensory neurons, this is a tricky idea, but the idea is that a pain response is a contractile response. So when the fascia really contracts, we get an ow. So it's not very technical. I know it's somewhat subjective the way I'm explaining it, um, but it is the impulse to withdraw. So pain could be thought of, as how Thomas Myers explains it, as an impulse to withdraw. And when we withdraw, the fascia contracts. So what makes fascia contract is poor posture, trauma, repetitive motion, and emotional events. So somehow it is that the emotional events cause the fascia to crimp and contract. And when that fascia is again released, the emotion comes out with it. And this is a great mystery to everybody, but healers know it's true. And so do yoga people know it's true that they'll be you'll be in a yoga pose in a yoga class and either you start to have an emotional response or your one of your students has an emotional response while they're stretching. And I have a little short video on my YouTube channel and I asked a room of 35 people who came to my book release. How many of you have ever had an emotional release? during a yoga class and 85% of the people raise their hand. So the fascia is part of our emotional body. It's not separate from our emotions. And that's why we have breath in yoga. That's why a good yoga practice, 
we bring the breath to the practice and we process things through as they arise and we release them and go back to a balanced uh, state. So the next thing I wanna say, number seven, fascia has a crimp. So if you're 15 years old, your fascia looks like a tight little zigzag. It has a lot of crimp and you have a lot of spring. Like when you look at uh, young children or young adults, they have a lot of spring in their step, right? There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of dynamic spring. They just kind of keep going. And who can keep going? You know, grandma and grandpa can't keep going like that, but they can. And part of that is the spring of the coiling that's in the fascia of a younger person. So the indication is, as we get older, the fascia starts to open out. And by the time you're 75, 80, it tends to flatline, which means there's no crimping. So the older people who are practicing yoga, and a lot of people are practicing yoga in their 60s, 70s, and beyond, it's easier to overstretch and not know it because you don't get feedback from the joint that says, stop, I'm stretching too far. And it's easy. And once you overstretch that fascia, then there's an injury and you have to heal it back up again. So things that heal fascia are things that contract. Yoga poses that contract the muscles and the tish and the fascia around the muscles. Walking. Skipping rope. Things that cause this kind of pulsing energy to happen. All right. So I think we've gone through all seven points about fascia. And so it can become fluid or not so fluid. And so let's go now to downward facing dog pose. And we'll start with a dog pose. You can have a couple blocks handy if necessary, but let's spread the fingers and just come to a down dog. And then in down dog, let's study for a moment the fascia of the feet. So raise up high, high on your toes flexing your toes as much as you can, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. And then extend the arms, reach the thighs back and go ahead and walk the dog. But when you walk the dog, try not to have any creases at the front of your ankle. So try and press your top thigh back so far and lift up with the shin so much that there's very little crease in the ankle and you can know that you're really extending, not collapsing and just just stretching the Achilles tendon, but really extending the whole sole of the foot back. So reaching up and coming back down and get the whole sole going back. Yeah, very good. And then come down and curl your toes under for just a moment. And this one is an ouchy one. So grab your blocks. And you can have them to support you as you go back. I'm curling my toes under and I'm going to lift my knees off the ground and rock back and forth across the ball of my foot. Try and stretch out my big toe mound so that I don't lose the flexibility of my feet. And the big toes help us to balance. So just rocking back and forth. And then if you can hold it for a moment, hold it. Let those feet stretch. I know it's very challenging for some people. There's a lot of restriction in the big toe. That's the first place that arthritis comes. And that fascia just gets stuck. And let's remember that Ida Rolf who developed Rolfing, developed Rolfing for her husband who was crippled with arthritis and she helped him release the crippledness of his body by manipulating his fascia and making it more fluid. So these kind of movements kind of help make the fascia more fluid. All right, and let's take the right leg forward to a lunge. And from here, you could just go in into your full lunge like oh look at me look how flexible i am look how far down i can go isn't that beautiful maybe 
but maybe it's overstretching my fascia and losing and it, common for yoga teachers to lose that stability in their hips. So I'm going to back off a little bit, come up with my hands, and then I'm going to press my shin into the floor. So press down, lift the bottom of the belly, wait there, and activate. So I'm activating my glutes, I'm activating my front thigh, my back thigh, by pressing my whole shin down into the floor. And then I'm going to come back down, go to down dog, and change legs. So side two now, hands up onto the knee. Same thing, you gotta pull the belly back, you've gotta to connect to the pelvic floor, pull the belly back, and then press the shin into the floor. Press it down in such a manner that you feel the glutes begin to fire and you get everything contracted to create stability in the hip, which is helping to crimp the fascia rather than just laying into the lunge and overstretching. All right, very good. And then down you come. Take a down dog briefly. And in your down dog, ask yourself, when you raise up high on those toes, can you get your hips up high enough in the air that over the buttocks into the lumbar and then straighten the legs and begin to descend. But don't lose the extension of the lower spine. And then inhale and exhale. Down you come. And have a seat. And pause. So those of you who follow me and my newsletter, I made a suggestion, told a little story about a gentleman in his 70s who came to me who practiced yoga every day and his lumbar became weaker and weaker and weaker. And there were a couple poses that he was doing that was overstretching his fascia and causing the problem. And while some awareness around those poses, one of them was pigeon pose bending forward was problematic. The other one was downward facing dog pose. But there's a counter pose, and I promise to show you that counter pose. So I'm going to ask you to either have a blanket or a bolster, depending on who you are as a person, either one can work. And basically, you need something to contract the fascia, and you need to keep contracting it over and over again to heal it, to help it to heal because the body follows usage. Whatever we do on a regular basis, the body takes that shape. So I'm gonna place my hands beside my chest, lift my inner thighs, squeeze my tail down, roll the shoulders back just part way, extend my chest forward and my legs back, and lift my hands off the floor. And you wanna feel the work in your lumbar. You wanna feel the work in your glutes. And you hold it and come down. So that's the secret. That's the one pose that people avoid practicing. And they really need to practice. If you have a copy of my book, Healing Our Backs with Yoga, you know there are seven variations of that pose in the book because it's so useful. You'll see more information in the show notes about my book if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, I'd love to have you as part of my uh, email list and keep you posted with the ideas about how to improve your yoga practice. So thanks for watching on YouTube. Uh, namaste. May you be well. May you not overstretch your fascia, but find a balance of movements that both extend and then tone. Blessed be. Namaste.